Thank you, Pastor John, and good morning, brothers and sisters. It is really a delight to be with you in Edmonton today. Uh, my last time coming through your city, I was on my way to some place called La Crete, Alberta, which was a little bit of a flight north of here, and I thought I was going to freeze to death. So I brought my coat. This was in October at harvest time, and uh, I brought my coat and my long johns and everything I thought I would need, and it was absolutely beautiful weather. <laughs> Everybody was in short sleeves, and uh, I was quite surprised. But I wasn't surprised when I arrived in Edmonton this weekend. But, you know, uh, as they say in Ontario, cold weather, warm hearts. And uh, it's a delight to be with people who have warm hearts and warm hearts uh, toward our Lord Jesus and from our Lord Jesus. And so this morning, I'm happy to be able to share with you uh, have, have, uh, about a message from God's Word, of course, but illustrated with the lives of people who serve God in very difficult circumstances. I have worked with the persecuted church through Brother Andrew's ministry, Open Doors, for 38 years. After being involved in uh, radio work with Far East Broadcasting Company in the Philippines, uh, where my family and I lived for uh, 15 years, um, one of the most beautiful countries of the world. For those of you who have never been to the Philippines, Ay nako, sayang naman. Uh, <laughs> for you Filipinos. It's, uh, and there we had the opportunity to uh, add to our family. We had two children when we went to the Philippines uh, as a young married couple, and my wife had a miscarriage. And at that point, we were saying, we felt the Lord telling us, that why are you trying to have more children when there are so many here who need a good home? And of course, in the Philippines, those who do adopt children that are in the orphanages there tend to prefer having a boy, especially families that don't have any kids. And so the, it's usually the little girls that are left in the orphanages of the country. And so we told the social services uh, who came and checked us out before uh, this opportunity came, that we would like to take the next baby girl that came to them. And that little girl is named Melinda. We called her Melinda Maria. Uh, and today she is um, uh, working in television with 100 Huntley Street. She has a TV program called See, Hear, Love. It's online as well as on television, on Yes TV every week. And I, I hope you get a chance to enjoy her. She was a sparkle to our family. And being adopted was never a problem for her, which is really quite interesting because it can be. I mean, uh, many times adopted family members can feel somewhat uh, uh, questioning about the, their origins and why did this happen and what happened with my original family. Uh, in fact, when our children were young um, and there would be any kind of sibling rivalry going on, once in a while we would hear her say to her older brother and sister, mommy and daddy had to take you, but they chose me. <laughs> so you know she was pretty secure. <laughs> and she still is. Uh, and so we now, through our three children, have 11 grandchildren. That's the greatest joy in the world for old people. And now, last month, our oldest granddaughter was married in uh, Montrembault, Quebec. And so now, guess what we're waiting for? Great-grandchildren. Yes, thank you, Lord, and I hope to be able to live long enough to see them and enjoy them. Uh, we have wonderful grandkids, and we thank the Lord for that. So this morning, 
I would like to share with you a message from God's Word titled, Experiencing the Power of God. And uh, I, want to, I want to begin, I don't know if I have control there, do I have, um, uh, it should be on PowerPoint directly rather than through the, the other system. Uh, but I, I wanted to, up here, no, I'm not getting away, when I, when I tested it at the back it was working, on, if it's directly on PowerPoint, okay, okay. That's fine. Uh, Open Doors began uh, over 60 years ago through the life of one young man who committed his life to Jesus. He became known through his first book, which he wrote after the ministry that he got involved in. He became known as Brother Andrew. He's a Dutchman whose real name is Anna Vanderbile, and uh, in English that is translated Andrew. And so, in order to protect his last name from uh, passport identification, and he became known as God's smuggler, and therefore known as Brother Andrew. Uh, Andrew is uh, still living today. He's 90 years of age and still going strong. Last year, he actually went to Pakistan and uh, ministered in Pakistan at 89 years of age and uh, is still serving the Lord in Holland, the country where he began. But his ministry is now worldwide and uh, 60 years of age. ...of Brother Andrew on the right, um, and his book that, he, that made him so well-known called God's Smuggler. This book is still available. And there's a whole generation of young people who are still reading this incredible story of faith, of a young man who stepped out in faith, uh, trusting the Lord and served the Lord in, in incredibly unusual ways. Uh, his picture there is, uh, take, is sitting in front of the city of Gaza. Gaza was where Yasser Arafat in his day was the leader. And Brother Andrew made friends with Yasser Arafat, um, and that allowed him to be invited to the training center where many, even suicide bombers, were being trained in the extremist Palestinian area. He was invited to their training school, the first Christian to ever speak in this Muslim school. And they asked him to speak about who is Jesus Christ. And Brother Andrew had a chance to spend an hour with all of those young people and tell them who Jesus Christ really is. This man was fearless. He would, he would go anywhere uh, to serve Jesus and to make friends. And he did it through making friends rather than enemies. And uh, doing that was amazing. So his ministry is called Open Doors, and every year they put out a world watch list. And we have a number of them on the table at the back for your taking. Uh, 50 countries uh, scaled every year on a mathematical scale based on what's happening in the country where it's most difficult to be a Christian and, and live for Jesus. And in this booklet, uh, which is a free booklet, I hope you'll take it because there are about 100 prayer requests for 50 different countries or for our brothers and sisters in those 50 countries. And uh, in that, so in this booklet, there is plenty of prayer fuel uh, for your uh, information and for your prayer times uh, about them. The uh, city of Gaza, where Brother Andrew is pictured there, is part of what is known as the Palestinian territories. This area, which is a part of Israel, uh, is number 49 on the 50 countries uh, under restriction. There are different pressures on believers there. And in that area, 
is the actual city where Jesus was born, the city of Bethlehem. Bethlehem, where Jesus was born, is technically in Israel, but it's in Palestinian Israel. It's on the other side of the wall that has been built to separate the country in two. And in that city is a Bible college, Bethlehem Bible College, training Arabic-speaking young people for ministry uh, throughout not only that part of the world, but throughout all of the Arabic-speaking world. Bethlehem Bible College is celebrating their 40th anniversary this year. They've been functioning there for 40 years and have an incredible ministry uh, there, as well as some of their teachers have been involved in a reconciliation ministry. So we have a ministry in Canada that supports Bethlehem Bible College and the, uh, and the work of the Lord in the Palestinian territories called Hope Outreach of Canada. <clears throat> and there's some information on the table there about Hope in Outreach, if you'd like to t check it out afterwards, as well as uh, some information on a trip to Bethlehem, a ministry trip that we're planning in October this year. It's a two-week trip. Uh, we'll be based at Bethlehem Bible College. They have a large uh, guest house there. And uh, from there, we'd be visiting all through Israel, including the places where Jesus lived and walked and worked. And if you're interested in that, there's, there's information there on the table. The next slide will show you uh, Brother Andrew as he is today, 90 years of age, along with our new Canadian director, Gary Stagg. Paul Johnson was our Canadian director for 25 years, and he went to be with the Lord. And Gary Stagg is now the Canada director for Open Doors. And this was his first visit with Brother Andrew last year. And uh, Andrew is, is uh, still going strong. The next slide will show you some prayer requests. I, uh, sometimes I get carried away when I'm preaching, and I don't have time to give you a prayer request at the end. So I'm getting wiser, and I'm now giving the prayer request first. <laughs> and so here are, here's number one prayer request I would like to leave with you today. Pastor Raymond Ko, his name, if you can't read the title, K-O-H, in Malaysia. This dear pastor is of Chinese ethnic background, but he's a Malaysian citizen. Malaysia is dominantly... Uh, populated by Malay people, and their constitution says every Malay person must be a Muslim. Uh, but there are many immigrants from China and many immigrants from India. Those groups are allowed to be Christians and to have churches. So there are many churches in Malaysia, and there are indigenous people in Malaysia, and many of them have become Christians, some tribal people even. And all of those churches can function without interruption or challenge. But you are not to try and lead Malay people to faith in Jesus, or you can get in trouble. But the good news is there are thousands of Muslims, literally thousands of Muslims in Malaysia who have found faith in Jesus Christ. And to disciple them is the big challenge because they're not really to be seen in a public church like you are today because they are Malay. And so Pastor Raymond Cole was one of the few who was discipling these new believers from a Muslim background in Malaysia. And the government knew it. He was having a very effective ministry. And two years ago this month, he was abducted and just disappeared. Nobody has heard from him. He has a wife and kids, and he has just disappeared. There is a new government in Malaysia at the, at the moment, and they're trying to appeal to this new government to have an inquiry to try and find out what happened with Pastor Ko. Is he alive? Is he still alive? We don't know. And as long as we don't know, we're trusting that he is, and so we're praying for him. So I would encourage you to jot down that name, Raymond Ko. Uh, uh, two, it's been two long years that his wife has been waiting to hear any kind of news. Uh, 
about him. There is video of the abduction. These were big black limousines that stopped his little white Toyota and pulled him out of his car and took him away. They look like pretty official vehicles. Uh, it's almost the most, most Christians in Malaysia think it's a government job. But Pastor Raymond Ko is, if he's alive, he is in detainment somewhere secretly. And the, the, the th if you were at Mission Fest last night, you heard how a Christian in prison or imprisoned can have an incredible impact on those who are holding them captive. And so we can pray for Raymond Co. if he's alive, that God will really use him even in captivity wherever he is. The next slide is a lady I'd like you to continue to pray for, Aja Bibi from Pakistan. Just a, a few weeks ago, Aja Bibi was exonerated from a blasphemy charge uh, after eight years in prison, this dear lady has five kids, and she was held in terrible Pakistani prisons for eight long years uh, because she was charged with blasphemy and, and given a life, a death sentence, which it is. And then the Supreme Court just recently exonerated her. So she's no longer in prison. However, there are people in the country who want to kill her because they believe that she's guilty. And uh, so she has to be in hiding. And Canada, fortunately, has offered her asylum in this country, she and her husband. In fact, right now, uh, two of her younger daughters, uh, who were single young ladies, are living somewhere here in Canada. Uh, even that isn't to be known or publicly stated because of security reasons. A family looked after these two young girls and that family was given, uh, allowed to come to Canada as well, and they're here with the daughters. So Asia Bibi and her husband are, have been welcomed to Canada. However, it's, it's very risky for them to even be seen in an airport in that country, and so she is still uh, in Pakistan with her husband in hiding, waiting for a, an appropriate time to make a flight to Canada, and even when she comes here, uh, it's not really considered totally safe for her, and so they'll be living in a in a quiet location somewhere, uh, almost secretly, but here in Canada. But continue to pray that God will give them um, the ability to be reunited with their family. This is the great thing that's on her heart and desire, and thank God for His faithfulness in allowing her to be exonerated by the Supreme Court. Those are the two really key prayer requests that I'd like to leave with you today. The next slide will show you my text for this morning. We're talking about experiencing the power of God. And this text is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It's page 818 in your pew Bible if you want to look up this passage. Uh, where the Apostle Paul says, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. Incredible paradoxes in this passage of Scripture. And I would like to read it to you from uh, the New Living Translation, in which the, the English is very readable and understandable English, um, from 2 Corinthians 4 and starting at verse 5. We read the context of where this text is located. So here's what the Apostle says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 beginning at verse 5. He says, You see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, Let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. We now have this light shining in our hearts. 
but we ourselves are like fragile jars of clay containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God and not from ourselves. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we're not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. God's word for us today, from the pen of the Apostle Paul, who talks about the experiences which he had and which we have and which our brothers and sisters around the world are going through right at this moment. And he says that we can experience the power of God. There are actually three Ps in this passage. Uh, the passage is talking about pots, about pressures, and about power. And Paul says, we have the power of God within our fragile jars of clay. Now that sounds like a good name for a musical group, doesn't it? But I think it might be taken. Jars of clay. We, have, we are fragile jars of clay. He says these physical bodies, which the Holy Spirit indwells and gives us power, we are so fragile. These are extremely fragile things. And when power is experienced through these fragile bodies, we know that that power to overcome the pressures that we experience is really from God and not from us because these jars of clay are pretty fragile indeed. So these are the pots. We are the pots. We are the vessels through which God works and, 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 uh, and we experience his power in these fragile pots. These, the power is there to deal with the pressures that we face. And all of us face pressures. Uh, but what Paul outlines here is a great example uh, of the pressures that our brothers and sisters around the world who live in much more difficult circumstances than we, what they experience as well. So he says, we are hard-pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. Okay, that's, the, that's the paradox of it all. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. And we are struck down, but not destroyed. And so that power of God is exhibited through very fragile jars of clay. But God does it. And that's the beautiful thing, is that we can trust him through all the pressures to exhibit through our fragile bodies his power indeed. And that's what I wanted to illustrate for you this morning, how this works and why and what what our brothers and sisters are doing in order to experience that power of God in their lives, even in difficult pressures. Uh, that's the time when we often see God more at work than when things are easy and going well. Let's change the next slide. And uh, here you'll see a picture on the left is my oldest, our oldest granddaughter who just got married last month, Cassandra. She lives in Washington, D.C., and she, and she is, I'm showing this picture because she meets for the first time her hero. Her hero is a young lady from Eritrea in Africa uh, who was speaking at a conference that uh, Franklin Graham had organized in Washington, D.C., and Cassandra, my granddaughter, was there with me. Uh, she has traveled with me to India, to twice to China, even into North Korea, uh, to Cuba, to Eastern Europe, and many other parts of the world. This young lady and her husband now are both uh, committed to missions and to sharing Jesus. But her hero, all of her adult life, has been Helen Burhani. I don't know if you know Helen or about Helen, but Helen was from Eritrea. The next slide, please. Helen uh, lives in this country in Eritrea, 
which is uh, just north of Ethiopia. In fact, at one time it was part of Ethiopia in the 90s, uh, last century. Uh, it broke away in independence, and it has an independent um, dictator who rules the country who happens not to like evangelical Christians. He allows Muslims to worship, he allows Roman Catholics to worship, and even the Orthodox churches, although he meddles very severely in their leadership decisions. But evangelical churches like you folk and myself are not welcome in Eritrea nor allowed to worship. So he closed all of the, all of the evangelical and Protestant churches in the country. And when they continued to worship despite the uh, edict that they weren't to do that, uh, he arrested most of the leaders. Uh, they don't, they're, they're to, even today, there are more than a thousand Christian leaders in prison in Eritrea. They don't have that many prison cells. And so they put many of them in shipping containers, big metal boxes with no windows for light or fresh air, no toilet facilities at all, if you can imagine. Hot in the daytime, cold at nighttime, and many of our brothers and sisters are kept in this kind, never, never charged. They never have a chance to go to court to even make a statement about their faith. They're just put in that jail until they sign a piece of paper that says, I will not follow Jesus any longer, and then you can get out. So all you have to do is sign this little piece of paper, and you're out. Helen Berhani was put in those shipping containers. She's a musician. Her crime was producing a CD of Christian music and circulating it among young people throughout the country. But, of course, she was also a very outspoken young lady. Whenever she was, had an opportunity, she shared her faith in Jesus. And she spent three years in shipping containers. People said to her, why don't you sign the paper? You know, uh, you can still believe in your heart, but sign the paper so you can get out of jail. And, and they said, nobody's going to know. And she said, yes, but God will know if I sign that paper. And I will never, never deny my faith in Jesus Christ. And the conditions in those prison, in those shipping containers are just unbelievable for those of us in the Western world. And she spent three years there. And finally, they, they just so frustrated with her that they kicked her out of the jail. But the next picture will show you uh, her book and what she said. She wrote a book when she was released from those prisons, those uh, shipping container prisons. And uh, it's really an amazing story. It's called The Song of the Nightingale. And Helen says in that book, this statement, it was so cold during the night that you would suffer, uh, she, she, she called it hypothermia, and that's uh, what we, uh, we often experience in those things. It was so hot during the day that your skin would burn on the edge of the container. The bugs that bite you felt like fire all over your body, but like driving a nail into wood, every hit, every beating, every blow to my body, drew me closer to God. And on the next slide, you'll read the, uh, her story of the experience. She was a musician. She created music and sang all the time, even in prison. And she says, uh, when they finished beating her one time, uh, because of her witnessing to guards and everyone else, they threw her body back into the container, and she lay on the floor uh, feeling very, very badly because they beat her so badly. And she began to sing a song that she composed. And this was her song. Thank you, Lord, for the cold nights. Thank you for the hot days. Thank you for the hunger, for the sickness. Thank you for the bugs that bite my body. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Now, the Bible tells us to be thankful in all things. It doesn't necessarily say we're to be thankful for all things, although sometimes the two are related. 
But in, in everything give thanks, the Apostle Paul wrote. And I like to hear that passage read, and I like to quote it, but it's sometimes very hard to practice. How are you thankful? How can you be thankful for bugs that bite your body and for a shipping container prison which has kept you contained for three years? But Helen was able to be thankful. And this young lady has just an incredible testimony as she shares about her experiences because the power of God was revealed through her a whole time she was there. And she says one of the reasons for it was that she was able to give thanks to God in everything. Okay? And she says, if you can give thanks, if you can be thankful in every circumstance that you experience, you will experience the power of God. The next picture please, is uh, two other young ladies in a totally different country, the country of Iran. And uh, Iran, uh, by uh, the estimation and the countings that as much as you can do in this day and age in restricted countries, uh, Operation World is documents that uh, Iran's church is growing at about 20% a year. Um, compare that with Canada, that's less than 1% a year. And even though it's not as large a number of people, they still grow. That house church movement in Iran is growing at 20% a year. Why? Well, part of it is because of faithful service. These two young ladies, Marzia and Mariam, who are from Muslim background, they came to Jesus as young ladies in their 20s. Uh, the, um, and... Uh, became followers of Jesus, and went to a training discipleship school, and that's where they met each other. And in that school, they determined to work together for the Lord. So they returned to the capital city of Iran, and they began to minister. They, they uh, planted two house churches among street people on the, on the street, and one including uh, prostitutes in the country. And I I said to them one day when I was chatting with them, how can you, when everybody is wearing a full shador, how can you tell who's a prostitute? They said, oh, there, there are ways that they communicate, even in, in a public place of uh, Iran where women must be totally covered from head to, to toe. But they planted these two churches. But in doing that, they also felt that they should boldly share the gospel with people as they could in whatever way they could. And they realized that the Iranian people were hungry to read the word of God. So everywhere these girls traveled for, uh, for uh, three years uh, before they were, they were finally arrested, uh, they would carry a backpack. And in their backpack, they had New Testaments in Farsi language. Many of these were provided by Open Doors for them and for many others that are doing this same kind of ministry there. And as they traveled, everybody they met, when they would, be, they would share their faith with them as they could, as they felt it was uh, freely able to, and as they would leave the person, they would say, hey, in my backpack, I've got a New Testament. Would you like to have one? And in three years of doing this, every day, everywhere they went, only one person ever said, no, thank you. I don't want your New Testament. But 20,000 people said, yes, I would love to have a New Testament. Can you believe this? Two young ladies in Iran. This is a Muslim theocracy where it's illegal to do this kind of thing, and Christians are not even really supported in any way. In fact, uh, very, uh, often persecuted very severely. In three years, these two young ladies distribute one-on-one -on -one 20,000 New Testaments to individuals. Often, they had a friend who was a taxi driver. Sometimes they sit, and in Iran, the taxis take multiple passengers, not just one. So they'd sit in the back of the taxi, 
he he had a he was a Christian, the driver, and he could put at least two or three other people in his vehicle that he'd be dropping off. And he would play a Christian CD in the taxi, and the people getting in would say, hey, that's beautiful music. What's that music all about? And the girls would say, oh, it's all about Jesus. Can we tell you about Jesus? And as the people would get out of the taxi, they'd say, we've got a New Testament in our backpack. Would you like to have one? And they were distributing New Testaments like this. For three years, 20,000 copies shared with individuals. And of course, you know that in a country like that, it doesn't go on forever because the secret police are constantly watching and checking. And finally, these girls were arrested and put in Evan Prison, the most notorious prison of Iran. And in that prison, they had the opportunity to lead women to faith in Jesus. They were in the women's section. They actually led women to faith in Jesus inside the jail. They were there for a year, and the pressure on them there was strictly come back to Islam. It wasn't, you know, you know, uh, confess what you've done. It was, we want you to come back to Islam, and if you will come back to Islam, we will just ignore, forget everything, and you're free and able to go. Well, they wouldn't recant their faith either, and they spent one year there. An incredible writing campaign occurred. Thousands of people around the world wrote letters to an address given to them of, of the Iranian prison that they were in. They never once received one of those letters. But multiple times, the people who were interrogating them would say, you know, you girls are giving us a lot of trouble. We have to read all these letters that are coming in here for you. And Mar Maria one time said, uh, well, if the letters are for us, why are you reading them? And they said, you don't think we're going to let you be encouraged by these letters, do you? Uh, and, and they would tell them about these letters that came for them. And there were literally thousands of letters that came for them that they never saw. And they wrote their story in a book called Captive in Iran. I got my copy on Amazon. And uh, these young ladies share their testimony and what they've done. But the basis of what they've shared is, is this. At the end of the, um, of the book uh, that they wrote, they say, for all the heartache we've experienced on this journey, we wouldn't have missed it for anything. It's been our honor to serve Christ in this way, to take up our cross and follow him faithfully anywhere he leads us. And that's their testimony. And so my conclusion is that the power of God also can be exhibited by serving the Lord faithfully, even in hard times. And this is the testimony of Marzie and Mariam. They serve God faithfully, even when it was difficult. It's, it's relatively easy to serve God when it isn't difficult, but when it is, they, have, they experience the power of God in difficult circumstances because they were faithfully serving him. One more story I want to share with you from the country of Iraq. And this is about a young man named Shirzad. Iraq uh, is now we're into the other side of the Muslim world. You know, there are two parts of the Middle East Muslim world, the Persian world, as we call it, which uh, countries like Iran, Af Afghanistan, Tajikistan, uh, these languages are part of what we call the Persian uh, language group. From Iraq and westward to Morocco, uh, we have the countries of Arabic-speaking Muslims. And this brother was in that sector of, of the Muslim world, Shirzad. You can uh, tell by his cool shades and his uh, sneakers that he was more interested in being cool than he was being a Muslim. He was from a Muslim family, but he, he, was, uh, he was not a, a very practicing Muslim at all. And he uh, married a young lady, and he wanted to provide for her better, so he looked for the best job he could get to make the most money to have the best life. 
Sounds kind of like North America. But this is in northeast Iraq. He was in Kurdistan. He's of Kurdish background, ethnically. And Shirzad got a good job at the uh, cell phone telephone company. And he is, his job was to go up the towers and to fix the challenges that sometimes occur on those cell phone towers that we have all over our country. And one day he was up in the tower, and down below were a group of ISIS soldiers pointing their gun at him, saying, you come down here right now. Now, they didn't have anything against him. He was a Muslim, as far as they knew. And, but what they wanted was to... Um, kidnap him for money. They needed money, and they knew he worked for the cell phone company that was a, a very wealthy company. And so they took Shirzad to a secret place and tied him up and began to beat him up. And they said, you're going to phone your boss, and you're going to ask for ransom money, and we'll tell you where to tell them to bring the money. So Shirzad is given a telephone and he phones his boss. Now, the ISIS soldiers that, caught, that captured him spoke Arabic, but only Arabic. He also spoke a Kurdish dialect, and his boss did too. So he talked to his boss in Kurdish, and he said, boss, whatever you do, don't give these guys any money. They are going to kill me anyway. If you give them money, it's just wasted because I'm, I'm, I'm a dead man. And so he said, please tell my wife I love her, but that's, I'll never see her again. And he hung up. It wasn't long before these ISIS guys figured out what he had done, and now they really beat him up. I mean, he said he was beaten so badly that he even despaired that his life would continue another day. And that night, after the worst beating he got, they chained him to the wall, gagged him, and blindfolded him. And in the middle of the night, he said, suddenly he sensed this bright light coming toward him. And even through the blindfold, he could tell that there was something unusual. And, it, and he sensed a person standing there. And he said, who are you? And the person said, Shirzad, I am Jesus, and I have come to set you free. He untied him from the wall took off his blindfold, and he said all he could see was this dazzling bright light and ungagged him and said, follow me, and they started out the door of the, of the home where he was being held. There were other prisoners there who weren't tied up, and they followed as well. As Shirzad went out the door, he looked to the right, and he saw the guards that were look, looking after them, in the middle of a fight, they were having some kind of argument with one another, and they weren't even watching. And out the door went this whole gang. The other captives who went out the door went to the left because that was the closest place they figured they could get help. Jesus said to Shirzad, you turn right. And so Shirzad went to the right. Well, the guards now realize that these prisoners have escaped, they came running out with their AK-47s, and they just mowed down these guys that had all turned to the left, not knowing that Shirzad had gone to the right. A car picked him up on the road, and the man driving said, Oh, you smell like death. I'm going to take you to a hospital. And Shirzad said, Thank you, but can I borrow your cell phone for a moment? I must call my wife and tell her that I'm alive. And he gave him his phone. Shirzad phoned his wife. And when she heard his voice, she didn't even give him a chance to talk. She said, Shirzad, Shirzad, you won't believe this, but three nights ago I had a dream in my sleep, and a man in white said to me, I am going to release your husband in three days' time. And, and Shirzad said, well, that's what happened. Jesus released me. And they took him to the hospital. It took him three months to recover from the beatings that he had received. But in the hospital, he told everybody about Jesus. He said, you got, he told them a story. I was released from captivity by Jesus himself. And, and there was a Christian doctor in that hospital. And that doctor came to him and he said, Shirzad, you've got you to stop 
talking so much about Jesus. They're going to kill you if you keep doing this. He said, no, 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 I won't. The next slide. Here's his quote. Shirzad said, no, loudly. I am not afraid. I was almost dead and Jesus released me. If he wanted me dead, he would have left me there. But he didn't. So from now on, please let everyone know that I'm not a Muslim. I'm a believer. Jesus is my life. I'm going to follow him and talk about him. He's my food. He's my water, my blood. He's my everything. The story of Shirzad sounds almost unbelievable, but it's documented in a book called Seeking Isis, Finding Jesus. Charles, um, uh, what is Charles' last name? He's the, uh, he's the speaker on Haven Today radio program. And he's a journalist who went to Iraq to find out what was happening with all of this ISIS crisis. And as he drove around, the driver that was assigned to take him to places he needed to go was this young man, Shirzad. And Shirzad shared with him his story. And he says, every word of this is the truth. After Shirzad was released from the hospital, Within the first year of that time, he led 70 Muslim neighbors, friends, family to faith in Jesus Christ. 70 in one year. It is incredible what Jesus is doing in uh, the world today. But Shirzad's testimony shows us the power of God when we are bold in our witness for Jesus. And this man had no fear when he was told that they're going to kill you because he was bold in his witness for Jesus. So brothers and sisters, we can experience the power of God, as Paul says, in our jars of clay, in whatever pressures that we have. In these cases, as I've shared with you, we've had pressures of horrible imprisonment. And Helen Berhani could be could exhibit the power of God and in her thankfulness for all things. Two girls in Iran spending a year in prison, but giving out 20,000 New Testaments in faithful service for Jesus, also experience the power of God. Shirzad, a young man who didn't even know Jesus, is released from captivity by Jesus, because I believe Jesus knew what a powerful witness Shirzad was going to be. When we are bold in our faith, we will also experience the power of God through these weak vessels and jars of clay. Let's thank God for that, and let's ask God to give us that power too. Thank you, Father, for the testimonies of these who have experienced in incredible ways, your power in their fragile jars of clay. And I pray that you would give us the ability to realize that if we practice these biblical principles of serving you, thanking you, loving you, and sharing about you, we too can experience that power of the Lord in our lives. Thank you, and enable us, Father, to be faithful witnesses, too, in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if I have control there. Do I have? Um... Uh, it should be on PowerPoint directly rather than through the, the other system. Uh but I, I wanted to, up here? No, I'm not getting away. When I, when I tested it at the back, it was working. On, if it's directly on PowerPoint. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Open Doors began uh, over 60 years ago, 
through the life of one young man who committed his life to Jesus. He became known through his first book, which he wrote after the ministry that he got involved in. He became known as Brother Andrew. He's a Dutchman whose real name is Anna Vanderbeil, and uh, in English, that is translated Andrew. And so in order to protect his last name from a passport identification, and he became known as God's smuggler, and therefore known as Brother Andrew. Uh, Andrew is uh, still living today. He's 90 years of age and still going strong. Last year, he actually went to Pakistan and uh, ministered in Pakistan at 89 years of age and uh, is still serving the Lord in Holland, the country where he began. But his ministry is now worldwide and uh, 60 years of age. So, um, here we're just looking to see if we can get, shall we change it manually? So I just, I'll just give a cue and we'll, Okay, I will just I will just wave my finger and you change. Okay, whoops, was that me? 